Hello and welcome to my next video on diet and food production. Sorry there hasn't been one out for a while, I've been very busy. But yeah, two coming out today. Woo. So, diet. This all revolves around having a healthy diet, well balanced diet. And a healthy diet consists of a variety of, of um, molecules. You have carbohydrates, they, they mainly provide energy. You have fats, which, which are energy storage, but also provide energy. They act as insulation, protect vital organs and other non-vital organs. You know, most organs are vital. And are also found in cell membranes. Proteins, these are used for growth and also for the repair of cells. They are also used in a variety of molecules in the body. Antibodies, um, enzymes, if you look at the protein video you'll get that. Vitamins, now these have various functions. For example, vitamin D is needed for calcium absorption or vitamin K is needed for blood clotting. Minerals, yet again, many, many minerals for various reasons. For example, iron is needed to make hemoglobin. Calcium is needed to help bones form. So lots of minerals, lots of vitamins, all needed. Fiber, this aids movement of food throughout the gut, but isn't actually used itself, it just helps it. It just helps the food move throughout the gut. And also um, water. It's using chemical reactions, moves stuff around the body. You all know what water does. Now, malnutrition. This is when you don't get the correct amount of each nutrient. Now, this can mean having not enough or too much of a nutrient. So, obesity is a form of malnutrition. That's if you get too much of a certain nutrient, too much of all your nutrients. But you could have what we consider malnutrition, which is also deficiency illnesses. When you're not getting enough of a certain mineral, for example, if you don't have enough iron, you get anemia. Also, absorption problems. The body can have trouble absorbing minerals, which leads to deficiency illnesses. And that's another form of malnutrition. Now, we measure malnutrition using BMI, the Body Mass Index. This is just mass in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. So, for example, if someone had a weight of 100 kilograms and a height of 1.6 meters, they would have a BMI of 39. Now, it, it varies from kind of different doctors, but uh, generally about below 18, 18.5 is underweight. Above 25 to 30 is overweight and 30 or above is obese. So, obesity basically 20% heavier than the recommended weight. Now this can be caused by too many sugary or fatty foods, if you don't have a little exercise or an underactive thyroid gland. Basically if your energy consumption is bigger than your energy output then you will gain energy so you become obese. Now diseases linked with obesity, type 2 diabetes, arthritis, high blood pressure, stroke, coronary heart disease and some forms of cancer. Um, now, you need to normally be able to know two or three to be named. Now, one factor that links in with obesity is cholesterol. Cholesterol is used for a number of things in the body. It's in used in cell membranes, it's used in uh, hormones uh, such as testosterone and steroid hormones. And that's all used cholesterol. There are two types. There's high dense, well, firstly, um, cholesterol is carried around the body. Since cholesterol is um, not water soluble, it can't be dissolved into, into the blood plasma and transported around the body. So it needs something to carry it, and that's called a lipoprotein. It's a mix of um, carbohydrate and protein, and also type of fat, whichever one you are moving around the body. And there are two types of this, high density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins. So high density lipoproteins, HDLs, are unsaturated fats with a lot of protein and a lot of carbohydrates. They are carried from body tissue to the liver. The liver, liver cells have HDL receptors and then so these HDLs bind with them and are broken down to make bile. Um, HDLs will carry away cholesterol so they reduce blood cholesterol. They're good. That's why it's considered good to have unsaturated fats. LDLs, they contain saturated fats, proteins, cholesterol, carbohydrates. They are carried from the liver to the tissues and now cell surface membranes have LDL receptors which will take them in. Now LDLs often 
are just deposited in arteries or other places which can lead to problems as I'll discuss later. But LDLs mean high blood cholesterol and they are bad, they are what's bad for you. So basically lots of saturated fats increase LDLs, low fat reduces lipoproteins altogether HDLs and LDLs, lots of unsaturated fats increase HDLs which then decreases blood cholesterol, also polyunsaturated and, and monounsaturated can remove LDLs, particularly polyunsaturated. Now, cholesterol is important because of coronary heart disease. This is usually caused by high saturated fats. So if a diet is high in saturated fats, it raises blood cholesterol. This increases the buildup of fatty deposits in the arteries. These are called atheromas. They can cause atherosclerosis. Atheromas occur, occur in the arterial wall and eventually forms a plaque which sticks out into the lumen, reducing lumen size. So this, this also leaves the artery wall rougher and less flexible and reduces the size of the lumen, as I said. So this reduces blood flow because not as much blood can get through the space. Volume is decreased. But also, since it's less flexible, it means that it can cause higher blood pressure also linked with high levels of salt. And that can damage the arterial walls, yet again, making it rougher and less flexible. Coronary heart disease is when this happens in a coronary artery, which is the arteries that take oxygen to the cells in the heart. Obviously this can be very dangerous because it can cause heart attacks and, well, basically kill you. Now there'll be more on stuff like coronary heart disease and other diseases in my next video on health in general. It's more about food. So, plants for food. Now, two ways we when you're making a crop you want a high yield as possible, you make the most money and waste the least number of resources. So you want as many as many plants healthy as possible. And there are two ways you can do this. Fertilizers. Now when plants take up minerals from the soil, if you have a crop that's in that soil all year round, year upon year, it will take up the minerals and use them all up. Then plants will die. Now fertilizers just replenish the minerals. So the minerals are replaced not to limit the growth of the next crop. And these minerals generally nitrates, phosphates and potassium. Also pesticides. Pesticides surprisingly kill pests that feed on crops. So fewer damaged or destroyed plants means that you've got a higher yield. And this can be microorganisms, insects or mammals like rats can all be pests. Now you can have pesticides which are specific to one species or broad pesticides which kill a range of species. Broad pesticides can harm non-pest species so they're not as good. Animals for food. The main way of helping animals is antibiotics. Now this treats or prevents diseases caused by bacteria. If an animal, let's say a cow, was to get a bacterial disease, it's going to use up energy fighting off that disease. So you get more energy being able to use for growth. So you get increased growth rate as well as increased size. It also reduces the spread of disease, so it's less likely to kill more, more cows. So that's good. Antibiotics can also promote the growth of animals. This is because the antibiotics influence bacteria in the animal's gut, allowing the animals to digest food more efficiently. So it's it's good for a number of reasons. Now, other ways of getting traits you want is selective breeding. This is humans breeding organisms for desired characteristics over many generations. This could be if you want to if you find say you have a field of cows and half of them have really, really big muscles and lots of fat but the other half don't. You'll deliberately breed the half of the big cows with the other big cows to get more big cows and do that over many generations so you get a massive cow at the end, high yield. And you might do that, oh well, that says high yield not high yield. Um, so you want high yield, you might want resistance to pesticides or herbicides or anything like that. Taste. Let's say you have milk, milk can have better taste or it can have drugs in it which um, help the immune system. Also, um, the um, what it looks like. You you know, if you have 
plants which are really, let's say bananas, which are really bright yellow, you're going to make sure those banana plants breed with other bright yellow ones. Because you don't really want ones that look kind of red, for example. And the other th thing we use for food, microorganisms. These can be used in bread. This is made by mixing yeast, sugar, flour and water into a dough. The yeast turns sugar into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Is the carbon dioxide that makes bread rise, and also obviously ethanol can also be used in alcohol. Wine, yet again yeast, but this is added to grape juice, and then it's turned into ethanol carbon dioxide. But this ethanol is slightly different to what we consider beer ethanol. Cheese is made by adding um, bacteria to milk. The bacteria turn the sugar in the milk into lactic acid. The bacteria. Um, you might know if any of you done B3 um, from GCC is the lactobacillus and turns the milk into lactic acid which causes the milk to curdle an enzyme is then used to turn the curdled milk into curds and whey the curds are separated off and left to ripen and you get cheese and uh, yogurt as well yogurt very same process but the bacteria turn the sugar into milk from the sorry turn sugar in the milk into lactic acid causing the milk to clot and thicken into yogurt so very similar I use this pasteurization by the way sorry I do have a terrible cold today right, so advantages of using microorganisms for food microorganisms can grow rapidly under the right conditions so food can be produced quickly bacteria can reproduce once every twen twen 20 minutes so that's good they can grow in a range of they can grow on a range of inexpensive materials, particularly um, materials that are waste products of other chemical processes, which is good. Their environment can be artificially controlled. You can grow food anywhere, any time of year, any country, as long as you have the money to create these, you know, massive vats. But, you know, you can control pH, temperature, sugar content, all that. Conditions for growth are quite easy to create. And some of the food made from using microorganisms often last longer in storage than the raw product they're made from. So um, the whole idea how why cheese was first made was because it was a way of prolonging the life of milk. You know, cavemen did this. But there are disadvantages. Very easy for food contaminations. It takes one different bacteria to get in and it will take over the whole, the, the whole vat of sugar and it will reproduce very quickly because it's in good conditions. So this can this can cause food to spoil or even cause food poisoning. Also, the conditions re required to grow microorganisms can be simple to create, but small changes, a little bit of a rise in pH, drop in temperature, and you can, can kill the microorganisms and you lose your yield. Also, lots of humans don't particularly like the idea of eating microorganisms. So ways of preserving food right. there's salting sugar freezing pickling heating irradiation okay. salting is adding salt salt inhibits the growth of microorganisms by interfering with their ability to absorb water so it makes them last longer because these are talking about bad and unwanted back uh, microorganisms that you have in your food like mold you don't want that sugar does very the same basically the same thing Freezing. Um, if you if you lower the temperature, you slow down the reaction. You know, slow down reactions taking place in microorganisms. Freeze the water in the food. Microorganisms can't use it. It can preserve food for many many months. Also, the same heating has can kill microorganisms present. Um, that's what pasteurization is. I think in yogurt is heating it to eighty seven degrees. Um, don't quote me on that, but I think so. Pickling. This is very low or acidic pHs and reduces enzyme activity in microorganisms, so you can't, you, they can't grow. And irradiation, yet again, just kills microorganisms. Oh, nice and simple there. Questions, just on two, because as I say, my pen, all my pens are now dead and I can't use any of them. So this will be the last video until I buy some new ones. So state two causes of obesity and give potential problems it should be problems, not problems. Problems with a low carbohydrate diet. I'll give you a few seconds to pause and answer. Good. Right, so 
Two causes of obesity, eating too much, little exercise, energy intake greater than use, also underactive thyroid gland, though it isn't very common. And now I've, I, I've missed out quite a few deans here because there's a massive long list. Give potential problems cause problems caused with a low carbohydrate diet. Now, when you think of a low carbohydrate diet, you need to think of all sugars gone. That includes sugars in fruits, so you can get vitamin deficiency problems like scurvy. It also means that you won't get the correct amount of high density lipoproteins, so you get more LDL, so cholesterol increases, coronary heart disease, stroke, you get all these problems. Also, you can have less energy tied very quickly. And there are many more, I'm sure you've probably all thought of others which I didn't write down. So, conclusion. You need a balanced diet made of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, minerals, fibre, water, all that. And not having correct proportions of these can lead to malnutrition, that's obesity or deficiency. A big problem with obesity is coronary heart disease. That is when atheromas occur in the coronary coronary arteries in the in the heart causing lack of oxygen to reach because LDLs are deposited in the arteries reducing space reducing volume toughening up and making the um, artery wall less flexible and increasing blood pressure and what often will happen is a clot will form which will then stop all oxygen passage so you need plants and animals for food plants can be controlled with um, pesticides, fertilizers, and herbicides. Animals are particularly controlled with antibiotics. And to get the desired characteristics, you selectively breed organisms. But also, microorganisms can be made for food in examples of cheese, wine, beer, yogurt. And you can also control the prevent of bad microorganisms with conditions, well, with um, techniques such as pickling or salting, irradiation. So, thank you for listening. That's my that's my video. I'll, I'm just about to do the health one now. Sorry if these two are a bit rushed. I really want to get them out for you guys. I've got a few people asking for them. And, yeah, it seems to be going well. I seem to be enjoying my videos. 56 subscribers. It's amazing. Wow. Um, and only five of them are people I know. So that's 51 subscribers from the general public, which I think is amazing. So yeah, if you've got um, anything you want to ask or any improvements I can make to my videos, as usual, anything I didn't explain fully or not at all in this video, just ask. You know, my email's in the description. Most of you know me on the student room, Munro T07. So feel free to message me, and thanks for listening. Bye.